visions in my head. People tell me that I'm crazy. I tell them that's exactly it. Okay, so when you go back to your life, is there a time that you can pinpoint like where your addiction started? Oh, for sure. I even know like where I was and how it all manifested, which is uncommon because a lot of people that I talked to were like, well, I partied a little bit and then I became addicted. But for me, I was a very socially awkward, very weird kid um, who would read books in the corner. I had no friends and I got in trouble one day for throwing a textbook at this girl that called me some shit, I don't know, ugly or weird. And I just had enough. So I took this heavy textbook that I had wrapped in, um, you know, like the paper bags, like old school mm -hmm. style. I don't know if kids know what that is anymore. And I threw it at this chick's head and she freaked out and she was loud about it. And I got sent to detention, which was not anything new for me because <laughs> I lived in <laughs> detention. And I went there and I was so upset and just broken down. And I had met someone in detention and I kind of told her why I was there. And she invited me over to her house after school. And I was like, of course I want to go to your house. Like I have no friends. I'm just going to go home and read a book in my room by myself. You know, I was that kind of awkward. And I went to her house and the first thing she did was hand me a beer. And I thought, oh my God, this tastes disgusting. But I kept drinking it anyway, because I don't know if I like didn't want to be rude or like she gave it to me and like, I have no friends. So I'm going to drink this disgusting beverage. At the end of that beer, I was like, oh, wow. It was like, I just took a deep breath and I felt good and I didn't feel awkward. I was talking and I was bubbly and it brought out a personality. It brought out a side to my personality that I hadn't tapped into before. And growing up, I'd always heard like dare to stay away from drugs. Alcohol wasn't a conversation when I was 12, you know, and I'm 31 now. So obviously that is, you know, a component to being sober and, and understanding the disease of alcoholism and addiction. Um, but at 12, I'm like, cool, this makes me feel great. And that is kind of where it started. And from there it steamrolled into pill addiction and, uh, pills led to heroin, heroin led to meth. And I struggled for like 10 years. How old were you the first time you got arrested? Oh, girl. Mm, 14, maybe. What was it for? I think it was for underage drinking. I think that okay. was the first time. Wow. Okay, so fast forward to your, I feel like the ma majority of what you talk about, I'm like your biggest fan on TikTok. Oh my God. Oh. I have to say, side note, the mental health Molly TikTok that you made it literally the funniest thing backstory um there was a tiktok account that commented on one of jessica's tiktoks obviously and said something along the line something really hateful in really counterproductive to you know what mental health molly would be and your response <laughs> was just so good what can you actually go into that really quickly while we're here yeah. Um, a lot of people want to shy away from hate, um, but I'm in a very specific niche on the internet and prison reform and mental health and addiction is, you know, everything that I do. So when I see people that want to talk shit about someone going to prison because of their mental health, I put that front and center, you know, especially with the name mental health, Molly, I was mental like, I have health. to, I have to hit you this. Had to. You had to, it <laughs> yeah. was horrible. Okay. So you end up going to prison and then you end up finding out you're pregnant. Can you take us through a little bit of that story? Sure. Um, I was addicted to meth at the time, selling meth for the cartel. Um, I was also simultaneously on the run from some felony charges out of New York. And um, my addiction was so bad that it almost made me take my life on several occasions. Uh, I would carry guns. I would sell guns. So I always had an availability to them. They were always around and I almost shot myself a couple of times. So when I was arrested, I was literally at my breaking point. You know, I'm like, I don't even care. Take me to jail. Who gives a shit anymore? Like my life is so bad and I created that. So there was a lot of guilt, a lot of shame and bitterness around my entire life. I mean, I, I wanted to be a dealer. I wanted to be in that world. Um, and I was struggling with mental health and drug addiction. So get arrested. Uh, they charged me with possession with intent to deliver, which is really strange because that was my personal use, but you can't argue that if you carry over a certain amount, you get intent to deliver as associated with that. 
Um, so I got delivery or possession with intent of methamphetamine over two ounces. I got delivery of meth when I would not cooperate with them. And then simultaneous possession of drugs and a firearm. I'm thinking I'm going away for 20 years, you know, and I was so low and so broken that I didn't even care. So, you know, the first offer on the table was 20. I told them, no, I told them I had, you know, to fight because, um, about a week or so into my jail stay, they told me I was pregnant and I had no idea. Like, obviously I was there when I got pregnant, but I had no idea how I got pregnant. I was on birth control. I was very sick, not healthy at all. So I'm like, how did this even happen? Like, like that poor nurse had anything to do with it. I'm like yelling at her. (laughs) I'm like, "You, you got the wrong one. Like, it's not me. Um, so I spent a lot of time in denial, but I also spent a lot of time fighting my case because now it's not just about my life. I have a person with me and that was such a weird experience for me because I never wanted kids. I never wanted to be a mom. I didn't even want to be alive. And now I'm being told I'm going to be a mother. Also, I'm going back to prison. So I didn't know what to do. And a lot of, a lot of that time, like I said, was spent in denial. Um, so about six months in, I had turned down my second plea of 10 years and I thought, oh my gosh, we're negotiating. You offered me 20. Now you offered me 10 months later. So I'm like, I can get a better deal. And I ultimately, um, signed a five-year deal with 15 suspended, went to prison and I had my daughter in prison. What was prison? Like, I know that's such a broad question, but I think people have some sort of idea. I have someone that was close to me. So I know a little bit more just from their experience, but what was it like for you? Like friendship wise, your first day there, I can't, I know that is such a vague question, but just day to day, like, how did you feel? Did you have a period of time where you felt like you'd really, um, like times that were like, I know you probably have like low lows and if, did you have any highs at all? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it kind of came in like waves. So my first few weeks were spent sleeping and other women in the pod were trying to get me to eat. Um, and I was having a really hard time with that. I was fortunate enough to be locked up with people that I knew from the street, even though I was in Arkansas, but I sold a lot of drugs (laughs) to a lot of people and they knew who I was and I had people looking out for me. And I appreciate that more than I don't more than words could even say. So I would get woken up like, Jess, have you eaten today? Have you drank any water? Are you, are you okay? Are you alive? Um, so once the early stages of detox kind of wore off, um, I was still very aggressive. Um, there was this very clear line for me, us versus them, meaning, um, cons versus cops. You know, um, I didn't, uh, play nice with correctional officers. I didn't respect them, appreciate them, or even see what their job entailed at the time. So my time was tough. Um, I remember one day where my cellmate Hollywood, who my audience still has not met, I've got to get her on the show. Um, she threw me a baby shower and it was the most depressing shit ever, you know, and everyone else is trying to be strong for me and smile. And we made some food and like, just to cheer me up or whatever. We found out the gender of my baby. She was a girl and I was literally like, I was smiling. So everyone else thought I was okay, but I was dying inside, you know, like this is not normal. This is terrible. I don't want a fucking baby shower. I don't want a card. I don't want you to tell me everything's going to be okay because everything's not okay. You know? So I had moments where other people tried to cheer me up and make me happy and, you know, calm the storm that was going on. But for me, it was just a constant source of tension and stress and, and hardship, especially after she was born. What are friendships like in prison? Um, you know, you have to be careful with friendships. You have to be careful of, you know, who you hang out with and who you associate with because things can pop off at any time. Fights can happen. Drama can happen at the drop of a hat. We're all tired. We're all not sleeping well. We're not hydrated. We're not eating right. Um, we're all, we all miss our family. Some of us are detoxing. So emotions run really high. And you have to be careful on what you say and careful who you sit with, who you hang out with. Um, We do something called verify. You know, we have to verify that you are who you say you are. You didn't hurt a child. Like there's some prison politics surrounding um, who you can and cannot associate with or who you will or will not associate with. 
Um, I drew a line in the sand when I was 18 that I will not associate with people that hurt children, kill children, abuse children at all. Um, and you know, you have to watch your back because I've made friends or I've been associates with people that stab me in the back or steal from me or uh, steal my letters so they can write my family to try to get money. It's a very cutthroat place, but sometimes you'll meet somebody that you genuinely love and you find a connection with and you still talk to years after you get out of prison. I have a couple of people that I do call my friend. Everyone else in between was just an associate. With prison politics, is it pretty just standard across the board for everyone that they don't associate with those who hurt kids? You would think that. um, It's very cut and dry, very black and white with men. Um, They cannot and will not associate with chomos or people that hurt women or children. Women, um, they kind of... There, it's not black and white. I've seen women that will associate with other women that have the same kind of charges, women that don't want to associate with bad charges like that. And then women that kind of justify it or they're like, oh, she's innocent. So they're going to be friends with you. Um, I've seen women compromise their own, you know, morals with that. If the person is rich, you know, you're in survival mode and I, I'm not judging or putting anyone down for that. I didn't make up prison politics or make the rules. Um, but we're all hungry. We all, you know, are starving in prison. And sometimes people will link up with other people if they're rich, despite what they did. With the correctional officers, I know there's a lot of things that um, are just so messed up. What are some of the worst things that you feel comfortable sharing that you've seen as far as maybe like taking advantage of position? How much time do you have? Yeah, for real. Um. I have seen guards bring in drugs. I have seen guards try to get into sexual relationships with the inmates. I have seen guards neglecting inmates. I saw a woman have a seizure and uh, we were left alone in this pod and we're banging on the doors, trying to get attention to everyone. And um, I don't know if she was withdrawing. I don't know what happened with her, but it took five hours or more to get a staff member in there. And she didn't come back to the pod, you know, so there's everything from drug smuggling to sexual relationships to clear negligence. Clearly prison, a lot of the systems, not that I'm the most educated, but like clearly there needs to be changes made. What are some of like reform or some things that you think need to change? Because I think it's pretty clear, especially hearing so many people's stories, especially when you know them personally and then come back. The first experience I had with this was really a year ago. And I was just like shocked by what I heard. Yeah. Uh, the first thing we need to change is people's minds. Um, I think it's very easy to be defensive and say, you shouldn't have broken the law when we're talking about these kinds of things. Like we don't want to, to see the corruption and the abuse and the, the trauma that other people are going through. So naturally we build up a wall against that. Um, But what we need to do is we need to have oversight on what the correction officers are doing. It's something as small as the wording surrounding articles when inmates die. You know, I was reading an article the other day and um, an inmate got into a fight and killed a sergeant. Well, it wasn't the person's name. It said murderer kills sergeant, like, you know, um, and that's seen across the board. So drug dealer takes his life in prison not Jessica took her life in prison. If I did that, the article would read drug dealer commits suicide. Um, so just the wording around prison needs to change, you know, so small things like that, but what we need to do is change the laws. So we're not locking up so many people. So a lot of people are in prison for drugs and you'd be hard pressed to go to prison and find truly evil people. I found them. I've met some cringy fucking people that I never want to get out of prison, but I met more people suffering from mental health and drug abuse than I met true criminals, you know, which is kind of ironic. Right. And Mm -hmm. I could get drugs in prison. So the first thing we need to do is decriminalize drugs that will alleviate half of our prison population. And then we can reallocate funds for job training and job placement and reentry programs. But it's gonna take probably two decades if we started today, you know, to fix the damage that we've done with our prison system. 
something that you said in, um, I think of either a video or a TikTok is that this person is in prison for one mistake, like their worst day ever. And I think that is such an important thing for people to keep in mind. It's so easy, right? People don't want to listen to people's stories. People don't want to hear about, you know, their mental health issues or, you know, how they were raised. That's a huge thing where you come from. Um, people, you're not set up at birth at the same bar as everyone else. Like that, that clearly, if we've learned one thing, I think even within the past year is that you don't have the same, um, I guess, starting line. Not everyone has the same starting line, right? And that is such a good point when you're thinking about how people just want to brush them off and say, oh, you're in prison. So many people that you respond to on TikTok are like, well, prison isn't supposed to be a hotel, things like that. And it's like, you're asking for literally the one, the bare minimum to begin with. And two, they're still human beings. Like you're still people. They made a mistake. It doesn't mean that your whole life is over, that you are no longer a valuable human being. It's really crazy the way that people will look at inmates or just anyone who's gotten in any sort of trouble. It's honestly like heartbreaking to see that they have to be such like, I don't know, cold people to really feel that way. I don't think they're like evil people when they say that. I just think it's easier for them to compartmentalize that, you know? Um, and I, I want to believe that there's good in everyone that's just like my nature to believe that. So it's so easy just to say you shouldn't have broken the law or it's not Disneyland than it is to say like women are being raped in prison. Mm -hmm. Women are being denied feminine hygiene products. Women are being neglected, verbally abused, physically abused, assaulted um, by staff members. So who are the criminals? Well, it's everyone, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and not all correctional officers are bad. I've met some really nice correctional officers that care about their, their job and care about the inmates. But, um, I have found more hateful and abusive guards than I have found kind ones. And that's a really big problem, you know? So there's a lot of issues with the criminal justice system. There's a lot of problems with our police force and I never want to speak in generalizations, but we have a very real problem of police, uh, what's it called? Brutality. Police, yeah. Police brutality and, um, and correctional officers just being aggressive for no reason. You know, I've been called a junkie. I've been called a whore, not by other inmates. And if that happened, you know, it happened, but by staff members, you know, mm -hmm. like you'll come back, I'll hold your mail for you. Can't you'll, you'll be back. You know, um, their job is literally to keep me in prison. My time is my punishment. Abuse is not my punishment. Rape is not my punishment starvation should not be my punishment. Um, so I think we have a really long way to go because a lot of people are very quick to, to brush it under the rug out of sight, out of mind. And prison is designed that way. You know, they're out in the middle of nowhere. You can't tour prisons. You can't go into prisons. The only accounts of what it's like come from inmates like me and a lot of other prison TikTokers and YouTubers that are sharing our experience. If you want to know what prison is really like, don't watch 60 days in, go to the Jessica Kent YouTube channel. <laughs> you know what I mean? What made you decide to share your story and your journey? It was everything from chain gang to having to fight for tampons to drinking brown water, not even having access to clean water. All of those things made me just crazy. And I told a lot of the women and I had no idea how that would manifest at the time, but I said, I am not leaving and forgetting you. I am leaving and I will find a way to fix this somehow. You know, I'll find a way to share my story or your story, or I'll find a way to let the public know what's going on. And I meant that. And um, I have a series on my channel called Locked Up With, where I share different stories of the people that I've met along the way. And I just hope that I can change some people's minds and we can vote to change our laws so that less people go to prison because we have a generational problem as well. It's not just the person that goes to prison that affects their entire family, their kids, mm -hmm. their loved ones. And it's going to take, like I said, decades to repair all of the damage that we've done. Decades. What made you decide? I don't know if decide is the right word, but what made you obviously I know well, you're in prison. I guess you can still get drugs, but what made you decide to get sober? My daughter was the first component to that. Um, if getting sober meant I had to love myself, I would be strung out still, 
you know, so loving someone else more than I loved myself is what did it for me at first, you know, and she just gave me a reason. And that's all I needed is just one reason to fight for my sobriety. And once I had her and I saw how unconditionally you can love a human that you just met, I was like, she's the reason why I'm going to get sober. Well, that journey has evolved and I've been able to learn how to love myself and fight for myself and, and be comfortable in my own skin. So the idea started with my baby. And then, um, what's kept me sober is not only my family and everything I've been blessed with, but learning how to be okay in my own skin, you know, not finding codependent relationships or, uh, bad friends or all the outside things that I used to seek, whether that was shopping or a really toxic fuck boy, um, mm-hmm. everything in between, I had to be okay on my own. What are some of the things you did when you got out and you didn't want to go back to that? You didn't want to go back to the codependent relationships. What are some things you did maybe more practically, um, as far as learning to love yourself? I cried a lot. <laughs> um, and I had never really cried before I was a drug dealer in a man's world. You can't show emotion. You can't show that you're stressed out or you're in debt or you're an addict. I had this no emotion face and I was very guarded. So Um, Just feeling my emotions was a huge step for me. Um, Not answering my phone, not activating social media right away was a huge component as well. Um, When I got out, I was homeless in a halfway house and I knew that I could get drugs fronted to me, which means handed to me for free. I'll pay it back when I make money or I can go work for $7 an hour, you know, and that was my biggest temptation. So it's like, Uh, um, just say no, (laughs) you know, do you want to come out with us? Do you want to go to a restaurant with us? Drink with us, party with us? No, no is a complete sentence. And when I figured that out, the power of no, and the power of trusting myself and white knuckling it and knowing to take a step back, that was everything to me in the beginning. Um, I would work myself to death, which I'm a Virgo. I don't recommend to other Zodiac signs. <laughs> um, I would work nonstop, you know, 40 hours a week at a telemarketing job, and then 40 hours a week at a smoke shop. I was fighting a DHS case and that kept me very focused. But um, the, the growth for self-love, that is an ongoing process. Um, I was in therapy and I, um, I listened to them for the first time, you know, I was in court ordered therapy from the age of like 14 to 26 or so. Um, and then I got out at 27. I don't know. I'm so bad at remembering the times, but, um, I never listened to them before, you know, they're like, you have depression. And I'm like, you're wrong. I'm fine. Mm-hmm. You know, or, or you have this or that. And I never agreed ever with a diagnosis. I never took the time to understand it or listen to them. And that was a problem. You know, I didn't think substance use disorder was a real thing. I just thought I could handle everything. You know, I thought that I'm stronger or I'm better than, and then I realized you're not greater than you're equal to everyone that you're spending time with. How did you end up getting your daughter back? Cause that's a really hard thing to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a year long process. I had to drive four hours to see her for two hours and then drive home for four hours. That was the beginning of my visitation. And then my visitation was increased to four hours and then six hours. So while that is great, um, it was very hard to drive for four hours, see her for six hours, drive home for four hours. That was a whole day. Um, I would do therapy. I would do NA classes or AA classes. I would do hair follicle drug testing. Um, I had to pay my parole fees. I had to have full-time employment, get a job or not get a job, get an apartment, get a car, um, clothes for her, everything. And I'm doing that on two minimum wage jobs. And I was so scared. I was going to lose her because I didn't have a lot of money. Um, and finally the judge saw all of that hard work and she granted me, um, overnight visits and then overnight visits turned into, she can live with you but we're still having to go back to court. So I, you know, had this, I don't know if it was PTSD, but I always thought they're going to take her away from me again. So even when she was living with me, but not, I hadn't won the case yet. I was just very scared. They're going to come in and take her for any reason, even though I was doing nothing wrong, I was still so scared. 
Um, and then I went to court for the last time and the judge is looking over everything, my lease, my car bill of sale, my jobs, my pay stubs, my, you know, recommendations from parole, from therapy. I had to take anger management. I had to take, um, child abuse testing to make sure that she was safe and all of that stuff. Um, and the paperwork was like crazy girl. It was like stacked up here and I'm waiting there for what feels like an eternity. And then finally the judge says, Miss Kent. I don't think I've ever seen anyone work as hard as you have worked as diligently as you have worked. And unless there is any objections, I uh, would like to grant you sole legal custody of Micah. And that was just the best day of my life. I broke down, cried. And I'm like, can I go? <laughs> like, thank you. Can I leave? And um, Micah was just so cute sitting there eating goldfish, had no idea what was happening. All she knows is I promised her ice cream and I scooped her up and we walked out into the hallway and I just fell on my knees, hugging her and crying. I can't even believe that I was able to do that, you know, because I kind of guarded myself and I prepared myself for the worst. You know, um, if I do lose her and if I don't get custody of her, I have to believe that it's for the best and I have to do everything I can and try as hard as I can. And, um, I want her to know that I fought for her mm -hmm. because I really didn't think I was going to win if I'm being honest, you know, in the beginning stages. It seemed like too, up until then, you had had a lot of um, not even, I guess maybe worst case scenarios too. So it makes sense not wanting to, you know, get your hopes up, especially when it's the thing you care the most about. What was the first week of having her like soul custody? What was that like? Um, well, I, you know, I drove her home and I remember walking through the door for that last time, no more court. And I look at her and I'm like, now what do I do? <laughs> Like, I don't even know how to make spaghetti, dude. Like, <laughs> guess we're going to figure it out. I can't afford takeout anymore. You know, I don't have that drug dealer money. Um, so I'm going to have to figure out how to cook. And that was a process. I now love cooking, but back then I'm like, how much pasta can a kid eat? You know, like there's veggie pasta. I can work that in there. And, um, we ate a lot of leftovers. I read her a lot of books. Um, the transition was difficult for Micah though, because the foster family who I love, and I'm still in contact with to this day, they had a lot of kids and now it's just me. Um, and Reese on the weekends, you know, I, I was very guarded and protected with Reese as well, because what if my daughter falls in love with you and then you leave, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was very hesitant and he didn't even move in with me until we had been dating for a year. And then even after a year, I'm like, uh, I don't know. I don't know if this mm -hmm. is a good idea. Um, but Micah would wake up in the middle of the night all the time and come into my room and crawl into bed with me, or she'd fall asleep on the floor. Um, or I just let her sleep in my room until other people were like, well, she has to be a little more independent. And I'm like, mm, we haven't been together for a while back off, mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. I know what's best. And then I started to realize like, yeah, she's four. Like maybe you should, you know, not let her do that. So I'm like, Micah, you can't come into my room anymore. You have to stay in your room. Okay. You have to be a big girl and you can do that. You can be on your own. Um, and then she'd fall asleep. Like she'd come out into the hallway and fall asleep right outside my bedroom door. And I'm like, okay, we're closer because you were crawling in my bed. Then you were sleeping on my floor. Now you're in the hallway. So, so close to you doing that on your own. Um, so there was a lot of moments of that where she needed, you know, reassurance and I would stay in her room until she fell asleep because she didn't like to be alone. And I totally understand that. So the bonding journey and her adjusting was a little um, difficult, but now she is going to be nine in June and that's my best little buddy and everything's great now, but it was a little rocky to begin with. I just love your story so much. I think on top of everything that you're sharing too, as far as actual reform and things that need to change and, you know, just sharing other people's stories. Another great thing that you do is and I don't, this is probably not even intentional, but I think what we were saying earlier, how it's really easy when it's a problem out of sight, out of mind. And it's really easy when you don't know someone who's in prison serving time, or you don't know someone who's been affected by this. You're not, you're not friends with someone who's like the daughter of an inmate or anything like that to almost make them like to dehumanize the people. And I think just by you being online and people feeling so connected to you and cheering you on with your story, I think that, you know, has done a lot, like so many good things for people who are, you know, passionate about prison reform and trying to learn how they can vote to best help and getting more educated on it. The last thing I want to ask you, because this is something I really think is so cool about you, 
one, I think you're an incredible mother, but also just specifically how you handled this with Micah and communicated with her about your story. Like, how did you first know how to navigate that and how to even communicate with a kid on that topic? Um, that's a great question. So I have a bachelor's degree in correctional program support services with an under in psychology. Um, so that kind of just helped me in the verbiage and the knowledge of how to share that with my daughter. Um, and I realized all of the things that my parents didn't do. Um, they didn't talk about prison. They didn't talk about mental health. You know, I was in my teens before I even realized that my mom has depression and that's why she can't get off the couch. Well, I also have depression and I want to go to sleep. So what I do with my kids, we now have another daughter. So we have Micah and Riley. Um, and I tell them I'm really sad today. We should make cupcakes. Um, or I'm really sad today. Do you want to cuddle up in bed and watch a movie? And I say that out loud to them. Sometimes my brain is just going to be like, we're sad today. So we need to make cake, you know, or, or Mm -hmm. my brain is telling me that I'm sad and I need to watch a movie with you guys or paint nails or, um, you know, I'm just honest in age appropriate ways. Micah was told that she was born in jail. I don't say prison. I just try to use easy, you know, words. So, um, I say jail and then I say sick for addiction. I took things that made me really sick and I did some bad things and I had to go to jail. Uh, but you were with me when I was in jail and that's why you like ramen noodles so much, you know, <laughs> um, I make it f- as fun as I can, you know? So every, you know, article that's written on me or my YouTube award or any milestone that I hit, I let Micah in on that too. Like, it's not just my channel. It's our story. It's our story. That's helping save lives and change lives. And she knows that, um, whether it's a little TikTok that I do with her, she was so excited, um, that a TikTok that we did together has like 5 million views. Mm -hmm. So I was showing her and I'm like, that's you girl. They're clicking because they love your (laughs) hair and you're so adorable. Um, you know, so I try to keep her as informed as I can while also remembering that she is a kid, you know, and I Mm -hmm. want her to trust me. I think the worst thing that a parent can do is instill so much fear into their children that if they make a mistake, they can't call home, you know? So if you're out drinking, I don't want the first thought of my kids to be like, my mom's going to kill me. I can't call her. I can't tell her. I want the first thought to be like, I fucked up. I need to call my mom, you know? And that's the difference that can make the difference between life and death quite literally. A hundred percent. I actually, it's funny that you say that because something that I say about my parents that I'm really grateful for is that they never, there, there wasn't really shame involved. Like if I messed up or if I need to go to them about anything, I've never once in my life felt like I couldn't go to them. And that's one thing that I noticed the difference between like me and other friends, especially with, I think being able to go to them for so many things made me want to do less. And I've lost very close people in my life to addiction. Like it runs in my family. So it's not like I didn't, that wasn't a reality to me when I was younger and not me personally, but in my family life. And so that was something that me now at 23, I say now has helped me so much just in life. And even now, like the first time there's any problem, I call my parents. And I'm really grateful for that now. Okay. I actually lied. There's one more thing I want to talk to you about. So you I'm can so ask sorry. me anything you want. <laughs> I was dying at your TikTok recently about, or maybe Instagram story. I'm sorry about the moms in, or the dad, something in the um, drop-off line at school. And it was, it's just so funny. How do you deal with parents, especially with parents who are so judgmental? I even think about like where I grew up and we always joke about like McKinney moms and all of that. Like, how do you navigate that even as just a parent? First of all, the the school drop-off line is violent. Um, (laughs) Parents turn crazy when they're dropping off their kids. And I'm so like calm and Zen about that. Like if I'm late, I'm late, but I understand like I work for me, I'm the boss. So maybe they have a job to get to, but like, listen, when you're dropping off your kids at school, chill the fuck out. Like Mm -hmm. it's two minutes. Like there's kids walking everywhere. So I get really protective when I see like parents speeding in school zones and all of that. So I'm already like on the prowl, like I'll protect your kid, my kid, anything, you know, if I see a kid and you're speeding, I'm, I might hurt you. Um, (laughs) so (laughs) yeah, parents don't typically ask me about my past. 
Um, and I've never had anyone make me feel ashamed about it. My next door neighbor is actually a teacher at the school that my daughter goes to, and they know my story. They know that I'm a YouTuber. And what's interesting is like the look on people's face. When I tell them it's never like, uh, prison drug addict. Mm -hmm. No, it's like, wow, you're so strong. That's amazing that you overcame that. I've never once in my life faced any kind of ridicule or judgment to my face. Um, I get a lot of hate online and I take a lot of heat. I'm totally fine with that. I know, um, I know me and I know that it's going to come, but as far as parents, I've never had someone say my kids cannot hang out with your kids because you went to prison. So not yet anyway, maybe when they're teenagers, that'll, that'll happen, you know? No, but I think just like being around you and knowing you in general, like it is such a thing that your mind immediately goes like, wow, look what you've gotten through and how you're even like, even talking to you now, when you're talking about, you know, having your first beer at 12 or 13 and immediately there was something that kind of switched to now it's like seeing your journey is so crazy. Okay. I do have one more question as I keep going. This is seriously the last one. Okay, when you go from, you know, having a beer with a friend in what middle school to selling drugs to the cartel, like how, obviously I know that's not a one-step thing, but how do you get connected in those ways? It's a great question. Um, I think like the chemical imbalance in my brain that decided that alcohol was gonna make me feel great um, is what caused my addiction to steamroll. Um, and I, I sought out any substance that I could, I did not discriminate, you know, I don't care if it's alcohol, pills, heroin, and then eventually meth. Um, but I, I was always really good at networking and finding the best deal. And I wanted to be the best drug dealer that I possibly could be now saying that out loud. I sound so dumb saying that, but you have to remember 13, 14, 15 years old, that's all I wanted to be. Um, that was my goal. And when you meditate and manifest that in your mind, you're going to become the things that you think about the most. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would pay attention and try to get better deals. And I realized very quickly and from upstate New York, I could go down to the city, get a bunch of drugs, take it up and sell it for triple my money. Um, and that was kind of the first uh, realization that I had that I had had to network and meet some more people. Well, uh, over the years, I traveled on a magazine crew and I became very charismatic and very good at talking to strangers. And um, I found drug dealer after drug dealer in every single state I've ever been to ever. Uh, that was never difficult for me because I can recognize it, right? A fisherman can always spot another fisherman. So mm -hmm. that was very easy. Um, and then in Arkansas, same thing, you know, I, I got meth from someone and I'm thinking this is a shitty deal, <laughs> you know, like I'm going to find someone else. And over time, the more people I talked to, the more deals that I witnessed, the more people that I met, I realized how to get to the top of that food chain and how to get a better deal. Um, working with the cartel, um, I don't really talk about this on my own, <laughs> on my own podcast. This is a whole podcast, but I did a favor for someone. Someone came to me hurt and I kind of stitched them up and helped them because they were in an altercation that involved a knife. Um, and the, the guys that saw that happen, tried to pay me. They're like, thank you for helping him. You know, they could barely speak any English and I didn't even know who they were, honestly. Um, but they tried to pay me and I said, no, 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 no. Just please make sure he goes to a freaking hospital. Like that shit's going to be infected, dude. Um, a couple of days later, they let me in to this empty house that they had. Um, they had just had lawn chairs. They were stealing a cable from someone else. Like they had cords out the window. Like it was a very weird setup that they had. And I realized this is coming from Mexico. Uh, that's where the meth is coming from. Um, and because I had helped someone, I just was able to get better deals and the meth was so ridiculously cheap. Um, and I was just making a killing and, um, I didn't even know how sick and how addicted to meth that I was because I never ran out of meth. You know, I had an, mm -hmm. an endless supply of it. So as much as I was like, I'm a heroin addict, I'm not a meth addict girl. No, I was, I was 80 pounds, track marks all up and down my arms, trying to wear more makeup on my arms than I did on my face so that no one could recognize that I was really, really sick. 
So, you know, it was a crazy series of events that led to meeting people in the cartel and all the people that I met along the way. Um, no, no one ever really questioned it either. No one questioned my addiction. No one questioned if I was okay. No one really cared because they made money off of me or um, they got drugs off of me. So I made sure to surround myself with people that wouldn't ask questions and wouldn't push back. And they were yes men, you know, don't tell me no, <laughs> don't tell me anything. I'm fine. Don't even utter the words rehab and you can come around. So yeah, that is so crazy. And now it's like the same you know, traits that you had then you're using still, you know, it's like still socializing and networking and things like that. But like, obviously not it with the cartel, you know, so that's the thing is that we have people in prison that have that same energy as me, that drive and that hustle, but we need to channel it in a more positive way, you mm-hmm. know? So if we could do something that helps, you know, want to be entrepreneurs, you know, you're not a, you're not an entrepreneur. If you sell drugs, man, you gotta, you gotta do something else. Um, if we can channel that in a more positive way, we could change lives, you know, a and lot of lives. I think people don't realize their true potential in prison. Sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. And if you get kicked and told that you're nothing for long enough, you start to believe it. So, you know, um, anything that I can do to help someone with their goals or their dreams, or even giving them a voice to share their story, I'm more than willing to do, but I hope to see that on a huge scale, you know, one day, and I'm going to keep fighting until I get there. Thank you so much for just sharing your story, not even on the podcast, but just in general. I think what you're doing is so incredible, like one incredible content, but also just like serves a bigger purpose and it's incredible. So where can they find you? Well, you can find me everywhere. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Jessica Kent vlogs, Jessica Kent is my main channel and I just kind of self-titled everything to make it easier. So we have uh, the Jessica Kent podcast Um, and my Instagram and TikTok is Kent 12 amazing thank you people tell me that i burn now i tell them i'm not like the rest but if i'm really being honest